Matthew chapter 6, please. This is the text, God's Word, that we are beginning reading from just two verses this morning. They connect with um, the prayer that we've been going through, the Lord's Prayer. And yet we're just going to look at these two, verses 14 and 15. Very controversial text of Scripture. Verse 14 of Matthew 6 reads, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Father, help us to understand this word from you. Lord, even more than understand it this morning, this text is so controversial because it's so hard to apply. I pray that more than understanding today, we would have obedience to your word. You would change our minds and our hearts. You would give us repentance where it is needed and faith where it is needed so that you would be glorified and praised in our lives through the issuing of forgiveness to those who have wronged us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, it's not such controversial passage because it's hard to read the words or a lot of big language is being used, but it sounds so unreal. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, in order to understand what he's saying here, first let's back up. If the Sermon on the Mount is, as I and many others argue, Jesus teaching what the heart, the internal reality of true Christianity looks like, then the Lord's Prayer and this section that's an addendum to the Lord's Prayer also is focused in on the heart. So it's not about saying forgiving words. It's about the heart of forgiveness. And let's keep that in our minds for consistency's sake. Our actions reveal our hearts. So it clearly flows that how we orient our internal thoughts, our affections, will be known by our external actions and words. Prayer, which we've been studying, is using words, right? Prayer is speaking words. But it is using words that have their basis in hearts. And that's important to understand. Uh, Cyprian, uh, the pastor of Carthage in North Africa, who lived and ministered around the middle of the third century, said concerning prayer, God hears not the voice but the heart. So if we are thinking about how to pray, which is what this text so far has been, right? We've looked at the last month, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, the pattern prayer. And if we're asking the question, so this is how we should pray, or we're saying that, the wrong question to ask is, what did you say in your prayer? That's like the pagan vain repetitions of verse 7, right? Or, where did you say it and who heard it? That's the hypocritical prayer he describes in verse 5. The right question instead of those would be, what should be my heart's mindset when I pray? That's what should be the right question. That's the question we should be asking ourselves. What should this be when I go to God? What should this be like? What should my heart be like? What should my mind be like? How should I be thinking? Not what should I be saying or what should I not be saying or what's going to get the most quickest answer, what's going what's to get me the best results. No, what's this like? Because prayer is, is living Coram Deo in its most expressive way. Coram Deo in the presence of God. Prayer is in the presence of God in its most visible aspect. And so God looks not on the outward, but God does indeed look upon the heart. So what's your heart like? What's my heart like? That's really what Jesus is getting at in this pattern prayer. He's not getting at the specific words to use. He's getting at what's your heart like? What's your mind like when you go before your God? And he tells us we are to pray with the heart perspective of sons, our Father who art in heaven. 
We are to pray as subjects submitted to the sovereignty of God. Our heart must, our hearts and minds must be directed down under God's sovereignty as his subjects. That's why he tells us to pray. Your, may your kingdom, may your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. Subjects under God. We are to pray as needy supplicants begging before our Savior. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sin debts. Lead us from temptation, delivering from evil. And finally, we looked at last week, we are to pray as worshipers with our heart intent on worship. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In the Lord's Prayer, it teaches us how to have our hearts when we pray, how to think when we pray, how to, what perspective we must have. And if we are praying as sons, subjects, supplicants, and worshipers, we're getting it. We're getting it. This is how we're to pray. The prayers of those who know and follow Jesus will be with sincere hearts, living quorum Deo in the presence of God. Thus, our sincere prayers from the heart will always have these four characteristics. Understand that. It doesn't matter what you're praying for, whether you're praying before dinner or whether you're praying before church, if you're praying publicly or praying in your closet. Not that you always say these words, but the heart of prayer will always be prayed as a son, as a subject, as a supplicant, and as a worshiper. All prayer will be prayed this way. If your prayers are not being prayed with your hearts like this, if my prayers are not being prayed with my heart like thinking this way, I am missing what true prayer is. I'm missing it. You understand that the shortest prayer in the world can, can have all these characteristics in it. God, help me. As a son, I'm calling out. As a subject, I'm recognizing I need help. I am under your wisdom and sovereignty. As a supplicant, I'm asking for the help. And as a worshiper, I'm addressing the one who can do something about it. So even the shortest prayer can contain these four descriptions that help me find in this pattern prayer. So pray this way. Now, you say, well, I thought we already finished talking about prayer. We did, except for that Jesus didn't finish talking about prayer. He actually adds a little addendum. Oftentimes, I got ahead of myself just a little bit. I guess I didn't, sorry. Oftentimes, at the end of a book, you ever read books outside of the Bible? I hope you do. I hope you read something besides magazines, too, and blogs and tweets. I hope you actually pick up books. I, I heard this great phrase the other day. Um, I, I don't remember who said it, but he said, um, paragraphs... Um, books don't change us, paragraphs change us. It's true, right? You're reading a book and you come across a paragraph. You're like, this has got it right here. I, I get that one little thing. But then the, he wanted to say, but I've never read paragraphs that weren't found in books. And the idea being, we should be reading people. Reading people. They read broadly. Read all kinds of things. Read some fiction. Read nonfiction. Read biblical books. Read non-biblical. Read everything that's within the realm of morality and righteousness. But read. And have you ever noticed, one of my favorite parts of reading is actually, because I'm kind of weird, um, one of my favorite sections in reading books is the um, table of contents. I love the table of contents, and I always read the table of contents. Most people skip it. I always read it because I, I like to know where the author's going before I start reading him. And I, I, I get an idea of his outline from the table of contents. I also read the forewords. I always read the forewords in books. You may not read the forewords in books. Like, this is just the stuff to get to, you know, get past this. No, the forward, I love the forwards because that's where you actually have the author usually giving his reason behind the book, his motive. And I, I like to know the guy a little bit that I'm going to read. And, and I also like to read the footnotes. Now, if you read fiction, you don't find a lot of footnotes. But in scholarly books, footnotes, there, there's so much wealth in the little footnotes that are found there. But another fascinating part of books, you ever notice at the end, you'll come across, and then they'll have the, the end, and then there's about 40 pages left in the book after the end. And those final pages often conclude what we know as appendix, appendices, or appendix, plural, singular. Appendices, right? Uh, and they're the little additions, little paragraphs, little chapters that really don't go in the book but they're an addition to it. So if the author was writing on a certain topic and he realized his chapter was getting a little long, he'll say, oh, this will be explained further in the Appendix X in the back of the book or Appendix B or something. So you'll turn to the back of the book and you can read a, on this one topic the author kind of rabbit trails off into this appendix. Kind of at the end of the book and it adds to the fullness of the book. It's not really a part of the story. 
That's actually what we have here in Matthew chapter 6, 14 and 15. It is an appendix to the Lord, Lord's Prayer. It's connected in the context to the prayer. It's not a separate topic. And we know it's an appendix because of what he said in verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then it's kind of like little footnote there, see appendix A. Appendix A is going to talk about forgiveness. Now, here's the interesting thing to me, how unique this is. Um, we believe, and I've said this many times, that Jesus said more um, than we have in the Sermon on the Mount than we have in these three chapters. Right? Jesus didn't get up, and in 10 minutes, for the amount of days he was on, preaching the Sermon on the Mount, just read these verses. He said more. This is what the Holy Spirit, through Matthew, had recorded for us. But he said more than this. So you say, well, how do you know this? Well, I do know that he did say and do more because John himself tells us at the end of his book that the Lord, Jesus, began to do more, many more things. And John goes on to say it this way. And if we even tried to write it down, the world couldn't contain all the scrolls that would write down everything Jesus says, did and said. So we know that Jesus said and did more than we have recorded in the Bible. We haven't, we're not missing anything. This is what the Spirit wanted us to have. It's what we need. So I have no idea. In fact, I would guess that Jesus gave more appendices besides this one on forgiveness. I would guess that Jesus probably talked about each one of these pattern prayer points. And he probably said more about them. He probably talked more about what it meant to be delivered from evil. And what it meant to be your kingdom come. He, I'm sure he spoke more about those things. But the Spirit of God did not choose to have that revealed to us. Why then do we have in this prayer seemingly out of place appendix about forgiveness? Why do we have this? Why do we have this little rabbit trail, this little off-topic, so to speak, teaching from the prayer on forgiveness? And specifically, not forgiveness with God, but forgiveness with other people. Why is this? Now, I know I'm speculating by saying that there's more, probably more out there. I think it's <laughs> intelligent speculation. I, I think it's very clear the Scripture indicates that. But I got to thinking about it. Matthew's the only one. Luke does it when he records God teaching in this prayer. Matthew's the only one that records this section on forgiveness. He's the only one. And I know God's Spirit worked through Matthew, but I also know God used Matthew to write in his way. Matthew's style. And I got to thinking about it. Perhaps there is a reason why Matthew, by the Holy Spirit's prompting, sees fit to add in this little bit about forgiving one another when he talks about prayer. I mean, think about the 12 disciples for just a minute with me. They were a ragged lot, weren't they? I mean, they, they, they were not polished and refined. <laughs> Perhaps Jesus talked about forgiveness and unifying love among the disciples so much because it was a constant struggle with these colorful 12. Wasn't it a constant struggle for these colorful 12? Didn't Jesus have to talk about this often to them? I mean, how, think about it just for a minute. How was Simon, not Peter, different Simon, who was one of the 12, Simon, who was called the Zelotes, and that literally means Simon the Zealot. Do you know what a zealot was in the Bible times? A zealot was an individual that believed the only way to gain freedom from Rome was to violently overthrow the Roman government by killing all agents of the Roman government. You know, to today's thinking, what Simon would be? He'd be called a domestic terrorist. He, he's the guy that's the anarchy, that wants to overthrow the United States government. You know, the kind of the backwoods militia group out there that people are worried about all that. This is Simon Zelates. Okay, now, now just a minute. Remember who this other guy that's writing this book is? Remember his name? Matthew. Matthew was a what? Tax collector. You know what the tax collectors, tax collectors did? They worked for the Roman government taking the money from the Jewish people. They were Jews who worked for the Roman government taking the money from them to enhance and enlarge the Roman government. You know, if Simon Zelates is like the kind of the armed-to-the-teeth militia guy. Um, Matthew's the IRS agent. 
That's who we got here. So now 12 people. Now just imagine you're sitting there and, and you have very strong feelings about the government of the United States of America. Very strong. Maybe you're not talking about violent overthrow. Maybe you are. What, you're, you're thinking this way. And in walks in a guy who sits beside you. You sing the songs together. You, after a service, you do what you're supposed to do. You turn and say, hello, my name is so-and-so. What's your name? You say, what, what do you, it's my name Matthew. What do you do for a living? Why, well, I'm an IRS agent. And you just sat next to that scum for the entire service. I mean, what gives here? Why would God not choose a bunch of guys that all like the same thing? Do the same thing. Think the same way. I mean, we're talking Matthew and Simon. That's different than sitting Republicans sitting next to a Democrat. Uh, we're talking about extreme sides of that. Now, I do believe they're both former in the sense. Simon was more concerned with the kingdom of God than he was his zealot tendencies. Matthew was more concerned with the kingdom of God than he was his former job at being IRS agent. They were former. But you have ideologies that run deep. Prejudices run deep. Perhaps this appealed to Matthew in this addendum because Matthew had been so impressed with the depth and completeness of Christ's forgiveness in calling him a tax collector and Simon the Zealot to serve, not just tolerating one another, but to serve as God's chosen alongside one another. There was only 12 of them. There was only 12 of them. And God had chosen them to serve together. You do realize, now the early church, they eventually they spread, but in the early church, it went more than just two guys that tolerated each other in the pews. Do you know who made up the pastors of the early church in Jerusalem? The elders? The 12 disciples. I mean, Simon and Matthew, at some point, probably early on, were not only in the same church, they were both pastors of the church. That only happens, that only works if there is a great deal of relational forgiveness. And that's what we see here. God taking absolutely unique and different individuals in the calling of the twelve and bringing them together and saying, not only are you going to tolerate each other, you are going to serve me together. You're going to serve me together. Because if God can reconcile Simon the Zealot with Matthew the tax collector, he can reconcile me to himself. And the greatest expression of God's work of reconciliation of sinners to himself is to see how he reconciles sinners to sinners. Paul describes this and he says, You are reconciled to God, be ye therefore reconciled. Let the reconciliation with ha you have with God produce reconciliation with one another. Now, I don't know for sure. I am speculating a bit, but I wonder if that's not why Matthew, by the Holy Spirit's prompting, did not add this, put in this addendum that Jesus taught, this little appendix about forgiveness when it comes to prayer. Perhaps it resonated with him personally. Think about it. Let's move on into the text itself, though. Before we can get into what Jesus is saying here, we have to understand two words that are used, because they're used often and very obviously very importantly. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. First word I want to look at is this word trespass or transgression. Same word, trespass and transgression is the same English equivalent of the Greek word. Some translations you might say read sins, forgive not men their sins. Sins is an appropriate translation of the world word, but I don't believe that sins is the best translation of the world word because it's not as specific as the word trespass is. They're not synonyms identical. Sin, the word we see often see translated sin, is the Greek word uh, hamartia. It's just a generic word. In the Old Testament, there was a sin offering and a trespass offering, two distinct offerings. And there was a reason they were distinct offerings, because there were different qualities of sins that required qualities of sacrifice. One was called a trespass, one was called a sin. Now, one's not worse than the other or better than the other. Ephesians 2.1 says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. In other words, bringing both words together. 
Those aren't just synonyms. He's talking about specific things there. The simple word hamartia is commonly used to describe all sinfulness. It means to miss the mark is what it literally means. Uh, because we are the children of Adam and Eve, we miss the mark in obedience to God and naturally live in rebellion, doing rebellious things against God. Hamartia is a big word, most common word in the New, New Testament for sin, and it encapsulates everything that is wicked about humanity. It encapsulates everything that is wicked about humanity. So when we say someone's sin, we use the word hamartia, it simply means that just generally it's bad. It's iniquity, it's wickedness, it's filth, it's rebellion. Sin. The word trespass, you could think as a subset of hamartia, a specific kind of hamartia. So I say saying it's not that they're better or worse, it's kind of a specific drawing the laser beam in on it. Paraptoma, trespass, is also rebellion against God. But the difference is, it means literally stepping over a boundary that God has revealed. It means stepping over. That's why the word transgress or trespass. Same word we use trespassing in someone's property. You stepped over the property line. You trespassed. That's what the word means, to step over the boundary. So back in Ephesians 2.1 where we see that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul is basically saying that our salvation to God, we were generally dead because of missing the mark and we were specifically dead because we constantly stepped over God's lines. So in both ways we were dead in our sins. Our spiritual deadness was an affront to God on two places, not just one. Paraptoma is used by Matthew in recording Jesus' sermon here because the emphasis is not just general sins, for if you forgive men their general sins, but it's spe speaking of specific nature, if you forgive men their stepping over the line, their transgressing. And paraptoma, trespass, is used here. It brings to mind a personal willing violation, and this is the key, against relationship. Against relationship. This fits the context very well, to use the word trespass, since the pattern prayer was about how we pray as sons to our Father. They're talking about a relationship to God. Now think of trespass here in these verses, like your four-year-old child, who you have warned not to hit his little sister. He said, don't hit her. And so, he picks up the toy, looks you in the eye, and you say, don't do it. He looks back at you and says, no. And swings away. Now, however it happened, right, he disobeyed. But isn't there a sense in which his rebellious act was personal against you and your word? And it wasn't just that he did the sinful act of hitting the child and disobeying. It was that there was that willing, no, I don't want to listen to you, dad. My relationship with you means nothing right now. What all that matters right now is that I have this uncontrollable urge to hit the little brat. You see, he's trespassing. He's doing more than just sinning. It's personal. It's offensive. When the word trespass is used in the Bible, and I think you should note this, other places where the word trespass is used, it'll bring alive certain aspects of the Scripture to you. It's talking about when it's personal. It's personal. Not worse, both are rebellious, but it's personal. Against your word and your character. That Matthew recording Jesus would use the word trespass here is instructive. And we'll get to that in a little bit. I want to jump to the next word that is used. The word forgiveness is another word that is used. Uh, forgiveness uh, means to let go, to leave. Obviously, this word is used four times here. The Holy Spirit is interested in preserving through Matthew uh, this particular appendix as it relates to forgiveness. The point is, obviously, not primarily God's forgiveness of our sin, which seemed to be the point of the particular prayer, but our forgiveness toward a fellow sinner. That seems to be the emphasis here, right? It's really about forgiving others with the idea of God's forgiveness as being a part of the reason why we forgive others. 
But what is forgiveness? What does it mean? The, um, forgiveness, and I have an opportunity to do a lot of biblical counseling, and it seems like the topic of forgiveness is constantly there regardless of what kind of counseling it is we're doing. And there seems to be a lot of confusion, I believe, in defining the term. So before we look at the text, I, I'm going to try to help us define the term forgiveness and then go into the text. Um, there's a lot of my sermon today will be explanation before we get to the text, but I think it will all make it quick when we get to the text. It'll, it'll come together. Um, the root meaning in, of the Greek word, ephi-ami, forgiveness, means to release, to let go, to give over, to hand over. It was classically used as a banking term, referencing the wiping away of a debt, marking it as paid. Um, when used like this in financial terms, it implied that even if the creditor wished to bring back a debt that had been forgiven, he had no power to make it reappear on the ledger. It was wiped clean. The debt was released. It was let go, one might say. The debt is forgiven. The word also, if you'll notice, has a very clear present tense idea. Let me explain it this way. Something that was forgiven is forgiven. Or it never was forgiven. Let me put it this way. The present continuative idea is very important because it's far better to hear someone say, I am forgiven, rather than to say, well, I was forgiven. It's different. When we promise someone forgiveness, we need to stop, we need to keep the present idea before us and don't ask someone, well, have you forgiven them? That's the wrong question to ask. The right question is, are you forgiving them? It's a present idea. Are you forgiving them? We often think of forgiveness as something that we did. We check that one off. I forgave them. I forgave. And then we find 20 years later, the thought comes rushing back to our mind, something they did to us, and we say, wow, 20 year ago, years ago, I guess I never did forgive them. Well, that's the wrong way to look at it. Forgiveness is a present continuative idea. And so it's more about what I'm doing now than what I did then. It's about am I forgiving, just like the word believe is a continuative idea. It's more about, rather, not did I believe, but do I believe? It's the idea here. So we need to ask the right questions there. It's the continuative idea. Um, looking through the scripture, as well as thinking through human experience, has convinced me that we really mean three different things. And sometimes we're not clear on what we mean in these three different things when we talk about forgiveness. And I call these the sub-points of forgiveness. I know that's really generic, isn't it? The sub-points of forgiveness. Um, first kind of forgiveness or type of forgiveness is judicial forgiveness. Now, judicial forgiveness is being released from a judgment or penalty that comes from doing wrong. In financial terms, judicial forgiveness of debt means they don't lose the house. In legal terms, judicial forgiveness means the criminal does not go to jail, being either acquitted or by a jury or judge or pardoned by the governor. Their debt is forgiven. They don't have to pay it anymore. There's no penalty upon them. Judicial forgiveness is not getting the penalty deserved for the wrong, the wrong that is done. I think a fantastic synonym for judicial forgiveness is the word pardon. Pardon. Now, interestingly, think with me. Pay close attention. Judicial forgiveness says nothing about relationship. The governor who pardons the criminal at the 11th hour does not necessarily have a relationship with the criminal. That kind of forgiveness is simply the releasing of the penalty. The foregoing of the penalty that is deserved. <clears throat> Often, when we ask someone for forgiveness, we are not necessarily asking for a restored relationship. <laughs> We're often asking for judicial forgiveness. We just don't want the penalty. <laughs> When we're asking them, please don't give me the penalty. Please don't bring the consequences upon me for this. That's a kind of forgiveness. Now notice, think with me further here, only someone who has judicial authority can actually give judicial forgiveness, right? I mean, I can call up the prison all I want and say, I hereby pardon the criminal. And the guard or the, would say, who are you? And I say, well, I am Matt. And... I live in Taylorsville, and he would say, why are you calling us? You have no authority here. I don't have any judicial authority on that case, therefore I cannot issue judicial forgiveness, right? 
is true here when we think of this idea. Let me give you this example. If someone breaks into my home and steals my things, even though I have been victimized, I am not the only one who has been victimized. You say, what do you mean you're not the only one? Well, we have this thing called laws. We live in a community of civilized people with civilized laws. And when someone trespasses the law, they actually trespass more than me. They trespass the community. They, they trespass more than... I'm not the only one. Therefore, I can't say, well, it's just me, so I can go out and get retribution. No, I can't do that. Why? Because they violated more than me. They violated the community. They violated the trust. They violated the laws that they have written down. Their agreement they've made to live in this civilized community. Thus, they have to pay for their crime. I cannot judicially forgive him. I cannot release him from jail time, even if I want to. Even if I say, I don't want to press charges. It really doesn't matter. He's broken the law. The police will say, well, he's a thief. We're, we're pressing the charges. It's talking about criminal matter here. It's, I have no judicial authority. Therefore, I cannot issue judicial forgiveness, even if I wanted to. Now, I could be a nice guy, and you hear this, see this all the time. I can get in front of the news cameras and say, I forgive this man for what he has done to me and my family. But there is no power in those words to release him from the penalty of his crimes. I can't do it. I don't have the power to pardon him. In some small way, perhaps I can choose to not inflict some penalty upon him, but really, that's not the word forgiveness. That's the word of not getting revenge. It's different altogether. Now, Jesus, in saving us, release, pardons us. He releases us from the, he gives us judicial forgiveness. He releases us from the penalty of our sin. But that's not all. Because there's another kind of forgiveness. This kind of forgiveness is called relational forgiveness. This is another aspect of forgiveness. It's restoring the relationship. It goes along with judicial forgiveness. And as judicial forgiveness is primarily about releasing of a penalty from a trespass, it's not concerned with relationship. Relational forgiveness is not so much concerned about the penalty. That has nothing to do with it. But about restoring the relationship of the broken transgression. Relational forgiveness is simply promising that I will not let the damage done by the sin, by the trespass, stand in the way of an ongoing process of restoring the relationship. Relational forgiveness is in essence saying, I'm going to seek to relate to you as I once did. I'm going to relate to you as I once did, even though you've wronged me. In order for judicial forgiveness to have power, one must have some kind of judicial authority. And in like manner, in order for relational forgiveness to have any meaning, one there has to have been some kind of relationship. In the first place, perhaps to some degree when I forgive relationally, I may also be saying that if in the future a relationship did develop, I would not let that hinder the possibility. But it seems rather clear that relational forgiveness is only possible when there's a relationship. So the previous illustration about my thief makes sense that I can't judicially forgive him and it really makes no sense to say, well, I'm going to relationally forgive him. I didn't have a relationship with him. I can't restore something there. But perhaps take my illustration, tweak it a little bit. What if that one who broke into my home is my adult son? And let's say that he does repent, confess, and come to me. I can't take away his prison time. In fact, I contend I probably shouldn't take away his prison time. That's overstepping my authority. But I can issue him relational forgiveness. I can do like the prodigal son. Come home. Come stay with me. Wiping it clean. Wiping it clean. You're still my son. I'm not going to say you're still my son, but every day when I wake up, I'm going to go outside and say, well, another safe night living with a thief. There's no relational forgiveness there. I haven't restored a relationship with him. I've not is issued relational forgiveness. Now, I believe relational forgiveness following the Scripture's expression is not really something that can be accomplished without both confession and repentance before the forgiveness. I say that because Jesus does not restore a relationship with us without repentance and confession, right? <laughs> he has that requirement in there. And also, for a relationship to actually be a relationship, there has to be two involved. Now, it's I, we, another addendum to the addendum we could go off in. We don't have time. Also, another addendum, is there ever a time when there should, never, should not be a restored relationship? I think there are times, some sins committed, where relationships should not be restored because of the danger they bring. Molestation, 
sexual assault, those kinds of things. But that's another addendum to the addendum. To the addendum. We won't go through that. I'm going to move on to the third kind of forgiveness, personal forgiveness. This is the third aspect. And this is really what we usually mean when we talk about forgiveness. This is the actually one where it has nothing to do with our relationship with them, or we can't do anything about the penalty, but we're saying, I forgive you. Often what we're doing is we're saying, I release my perceived rights to hold this against you, to gossip about this, to bring this up. I re I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to dwell upon it. It's not going to be something that's in my mind. It's I'm releasing of the bitterness. I believe this is what Jesus expressed when he said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Think about it with me for a minute. Was Jesus issuing judicial forgiveness? Was he pardoning the sin of those who crucified him? I don't believe so. I believe he would pardon their sin, but everyone comes to him the same way, right? Was Jesus developing a relationship with all those soldiers and Pharisees? Restoring a relationship with them? No, he wasn't doing that either. Jesus was issuing, I, and he's asking the Father to do this, don't hold your wrath against them for this act. He was issuing personal forgiveness. He was committing himself and them to God. He was symbolically expressing that he would have no bitterness. Not that he could, but he was symbolically expressing it. He would have no bitterness, no wrath, no accusation against them, even though they had personally hurt him in so many ways. This kind of forgiveness is not releasing a penalty, nor is it restoring a relationship. It is releasing my supposed right to respond with bitterness and anger, either externally or internally, against those who have hurt me. This kind of forgiveness is choosing to cast my hurt upon God, who will care for my soul better than I can. This is the way Peter describes it. When he was reviled, he reviled not again, but committed himself to the one who judges righteously. And this we must do with or without confession and repentance. My friends, judicial and relational forgiveness needs confession and repentance. Personal forgiveness needs neither. We simply release, release our right to be bitter and angry for wrongs committed against us. We give it to God. This kind of uh, forgiveness is giving it to God. So, I'm... Some of you may think that's interesting. Some of you may not. But what does that have to do with this text of Scripture? Here's what it has to do with it. The question that was asked me as I was talking about this to somebody was, so, which of those kinds of forgiveness is Jesus talking about in 14 and 15? What kind of forgiveness is he speaking about? When Jesus says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What aspect of forgiveness is he talking about? If he's talking about judicial forgiveness, pardon, then we, he would be contradicting, I believe, the gospel of grace. I don't believe it's just Jesus is saying, in order to be pardoned from the penalty of God's wrath and sin and, and to escape the effects of hell, you need to go around forgiving everyone. I don't believe he's saying that. That contradicts grace. That contradicts the theology of the gospel. The Bible tells us we must receive him, believe, repent. It doesn't say anything about forgiving others to receive pardon. So no, I do not believe this is speaking of releasing of the penalty of our sin, of our trespasses. Besides, what judicial power do we have to release people who have sinned against us of their trespasses? If he's talking about personal forgiveness, that is releasing my anger and bitterness to God in order that God will not be angry or bitter toward me, that also is inconsistent. That doesn't quite work. God's not bitter toward us. Jesus could not be saying that God will be bitter towards you unless you're, if you're not releasing your bitter towards others. God won't release his anger towards you unless you release your anger toward others. I, I don't believe that's, that's not consistent with the rest of Scripture or the context. No, in, in my conclusion, I came to believe as I was studying this that everything in this context, both the prayer, the content of the prayer, who the prayer is to, the use of the word trespass, all of this is screaming out the word relationship. It's screaming out the word relationship. Let me explain it this way, if I can. The appendix is under the broader teaching 
of concerning prayer as relationship, father to son. We said this er earlier, the word trespass usually indicates a personal, relational, stepping across the line. Remember what we said before? Trespass, the word means you've attacked a person's relationship. The child who has trespassed my word, they have attacked me as their father. You're my father, I'm the kid, I want to hit my sibling, I don't care about that relationship, I want this instead. It's an attacking of the relationship. Jesus is not teaching us in the whole context how to become pardoned or, or, or live lives at peace, but how one relates to God in prayer and discipleship. Do you see what I mean? Everything in here is screaming out about relationship. Relationship. And so I believe Jesus is pointing out to this idea of a, re a personal relationship. A personal relationship with God. He's not talking about, about a personal relationship and becoming born again or being saved, being pardoned for our sin. The whole Sermon on the Mount is not talking about how to become Christians, right? It's about how we are as Christians. And I believe what Jesus is saying, you could substitute this word if it helps make it clear. And he's saying, if you are unwilling to reconcile with your brother, relationally forgive them, what then makes you think that you have a right relationship with God? What makes you think everything's good this way if it's bad this way? And this is actually what I believe makes this powerfully convicting. I'm adding my commentary here, but I understand Jesus to be saying, if you will reconcile, you will relationally forgive those who cross that line against you, you will have that, enjoy that reconciled, relationally forgiven joy and relationship with your Heavenly Father. But if you cannot reconcile with those who have gone against you personally, you will not experience the greatness of that relationship with your Father. Jesus, I don't believe, is saying that there is some requirement to become forgiven judicially or personally. Nor do I think he's saying there's a requirement to being a child of God, but he is saying this, that when we live sideways with the people around us, we should not think it's strange that we are living sideways with God. Our relationships on earth do have an effect on our relationship in heaven. Not because God is turning on or off that relationship with us, but because we are. We are. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father never left the household farm. He never stopped waiting for his son. He never broke off a relationship with him. It was the son who left, who broke the relationship. Thus, it was the son who came back, not the father. When we trespass against God as believers, he hasn't left us. We have left him. We have left him. And Jesus is teaching that that beautiful relationship of a child of God experiences in Christ, in the Word, in prayer, can seem to be lost. And it can feel as if God has left us. It can feel that way. And God may even allow it to feel that way. He may even cause us until we are in the place of repentance, we finally understand what we have done. He may even cause us to sense a great loss of relationship. But it isn't God that has turned to us. It is we have turned from Him. You see, when we refuse to be reconciled with those who have wronged us, we not only are turning from them, we are turning from God. Do you believe that? I don't think we as Christians often believe that. We feel like we can do whatever we want toward our fellow brothers and sisters and fellow man even. So long as I pray and go to church and do my things I'm supposed to do as a Christian. I mean, it's fine. Nobody says I have to be best friends with that guy. I can just sit on opposite sides of the building. We can just never talk to each other. We have nothing to do with one another. And that's fine because he can worship God and I can worship God. And Jesus is saying that's not true. He's saying it's not true. It doesn't work that way. 
Refusing to forgive and restore a relationship with somebody who has sinned against you is the most inconsistent and sinful thing a reconciled, forgiven child of God can possibly do. Having been forgiven, and I'm speaking relationally here, given a relationship with God, even though we have trespassed against His holy, majestic person, how then can we withhold a relationship with one who has trespassed against our unholy, lowly person? The forgiven forgive because simply they've been forgiven. So I think I understand this. Jesus is saying that on the basis of having a right relationship, forgiving others, um, I'm sorry, on the basis that we have been forgiven, reconciled to God, how then can I withhold reconciliation to another? So, enjoy your relationship forgiven with God by having right relationships forgiving others. But why does Jesus teach this connected to an appendix on prayer? Why is this in about prayer? What's that have to do with this? What does prayer have to do with offering forgiveness to those who have trespassed against me? There's a couple of things that come to my mind. One of them is the greatest expression and mark of our relationship with God is our right, our ability, and our freeness in prayer before the presence of God. Is not prayer the greatest expression of your relationship with God? Or maybe I should say it this way. Should not prayer be the greatest expression of your relationship with God? So how can I pretend that this quite special and intimate vertical relationship is right when these horizontal relationships are marked by unforgiveness? How could I possibly curse at my children, push them around, call them stupid, and harbor bitterness against them, and then cuddle up to my wife, the mother of those children, children and tell her how much I love her? It doesn't make sense, does it? Because that relationship with my wife is going to be damaged because of my relationship with her children. How can I, spiritually speaking, say, oh God, I want to pray to you and spend so much time worshiping you. Oh, I fall before you while I cannot forgive those who are his children. How is that even possible? But I think another thing that came to my mind as I was reading through and studying this is that other scriptures, scriptures make this connection quite clearly of prayer and forgiveness. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Remember that passage we looked through? Remember that was the extreme passage of Scripture? Jesus is talking to the Galileans and he says, if you're coming to the temple to worship, prayer, worship are identical things in Jewish terminology. If you're coming to the temple to worship and you get to the altar with your gift and you remember right there that your brother, and not even you did something, your brother has something against you, what does he say to do? Drop your gift. Go 80 miles back to Galilee. Reconcile with your brother and then come back and worship. Connection being made there. Reconciliation on earth affecting our relationship in heaven. Another passage of scripture though, James 5.16. Though not specifically saying it the same way, seems to draw a conclusion. I'd like to read this for you. James 5.16 um, at the end of this letter, James says this, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now what fascinated me about this is guess what word faults is there? It's paraptome, trespasses. Confess your trespasses one to another. Doesn't sound to me like he's saying confess your faults, meaning um, confess your weaknesses. Say, yeah, well, I'm an angry guy. I want everybody to know that I struggle with uh, being proud or uh, I sometimes get, uh, do these bad things. You know, he's actually trespasses, meaning violations. And I believe the context here is referring to the confess your trespasses against one another <laughs> and then pray one for another. How do you pray with someone who there's a trespass against them? but probably one of the most powerful passages of Scripture is found in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. As it relates to the same topic here, and this, this one seems to come out of nowhere because it doesn't seem to fit the mold of what we think Peter would be saying here. And this is quite, um, quite intrusive on our toes. I just want you to know, warn you before I continue. 
1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, 1 through 6, he talks about women. He talks about wives. Um, and specifically, it's talking about uh, a wife who is married to an unbeliever. An individual um, who is not happy about her faith. What's she supposed to do? And he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, what she's supposed to do is she's supposed to have a beautiful spirit. Not worry about the beautiful outside. Not try to fix that up to make her husband like her. Worry about this, her heart. And he gives this hope, perhaps by her chaste lifestyle coupled with her, coupled with her reverence, he might be one even without the word. Even without the word. So we, that's what the topic is about. And he spends all this time. He gives Sarah and Abraham as an example of this. And, the, and they say, well, how is Sarah an example of this? This is what I think is fascinating about this. Um, he's talking in the context about bad situation. He's not saying Abraham was an unbeliever, but he is talking about what Sarah should have done <laughs> and what often she did when Abraham was making wrong choices. That's the context there. She still reverenced him, even though he's making the wrong choices. But moving, that's the context. They're moving beyond that. That's just an example. What happens in verse, chapter, verse 7 is very interesting because he says, likewise, you husbands, indicating that the same scenario could take place husband that way too. The wife's antagonistic toward things. Husband is to respond the same way, do the same thing with his heart. Maybe convert her by just his righteous living. And he says, instead of for the husband, it's by dwelling with them according to knowledge, um, being intelligent in how you live with them, giving honor to her, giving honor to the wife that he could even think of as, a, to use the word, hopefully not get in trouble, to give honor into the shrew. Um, is the idea there. E even though she's a problem, give honor to her. She's a weaker vessel. He goes on and say that. And he says, you're heirs together. You know, if you, if, you, if you can convert her, you'll be heirs together of the grace of life. And it's just this beautiful thing of how to live in a difficult marriage. But then suddenly he does this. At the very end, he says, that your prayers be not hindered. Prayer? Where did prayer come into this whole thing? First time it's mentioned in the whole chapter. And Peter is simply making this analogy. He's simply saying this. The most intimate of relationship you have on earth has an effect on your prayers. Has an effect on your prayers. Here, here's what he is saying. In a general sense, live sideways with your spouse, you're going to be sideways with God. Your prayers aren't going to go right. It's not going to work. It's going to be hitting the, hitting the clouds in heaven and seeming to bounce right back. It's just not going to be right. Hindrance is there. You can't pray. And prayer is a drudgery. It's not working. And you're thinking, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why is prayer not working? Why do I seem to not even enjoy? Perhaps, now I'm not saying this is the only reason, but, but from everything being said in all these scriptures, perhaps there is a problem with my relationship with God. Perhaps there's a problem there because there is a problem with people that I refuse to deal with. Perhaps my prayers are hindered because there's bitterness in my marriage. Perhaps my prayers are hindered because I, I refuse to forgive people who have wronged me. Perhaps that's why they're hindered. In fact, a hindered relationship where relational forgiveness is not pursued by both husband and wife or other relationships hinders our relationship and fellowship with God, our Father. I'm almost done. Thank you for your patience today. Modern Christianity likes to put our different relationships and activities into compartments. We are one thing as a family sitting together singing the songs on Sunday worship and quite another thing Saturday night or even Sunday morning on the way to church. We may pray and praise the Lord with the lips that moments before criticized and sharply ridiculed those close to us. Do not miss Jesus' point because of our struggle to understand his language. The point, quite simply, beloved, is to the extent that we pursue reconciliation and forgiveness with our brothers, our spouses, our children, even our neighbors, is the extent we will enjoy reconciliation with our Father in heaven. That reconciliation purchased with his blood. Fellowship with God and fellowship with God's people cannot be separated Forgiveness with God and forgiveness towards God's people cannot be torn apart. Beloved, pursue peace and forgiveness with those who have trespassed against you. And I want to conclude with this, an application I hope that would be very helpful. 
with a question. What gospel of grace do you preach? Has salt and light and salt and light where God forgives you the immensity of your trespasses against him, but you have little room in your hearts to forgive those who have trespassed against you. What gospel is that anyways? Indeed, the gospel that God demonstrated toward us is that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Do you know how to teach the gospel to your children? Teach them to confess and repent, and when they do, embrace them, love them, kiss them, cherish them, go get ice cream with them, run and play with them, restore the relationship with them. Do you understand the perverted gospel you teach to your children when they're wrong and they say, I'm sorry, Daddy, and you say, well, I can't look at you right now. Do you understand what you're telling them about God? Do you understand you're telling them that God can't look at them either? My friends, what gospel are you teaching your children? Are you teaching them the gospel that forgives or the gospel that is angry and filled with wrath? What gospel do you teach your spouse? Forgive them readily. Allow them to save a little face. Don't push your righteousness upon them in the particular circumstance. Do it before Sunday. Don't paint the smile on. Stop on your way to church. Admit you're wrong and forgive them for their wrong. But show him or her that you love them and that you love God and you love the gospel too much to harbor bitterness. Reconcile, embrace, kiss, hold hands, cuddle your spouse, and let them know we are reconciled. Remind your spouse who has wronged you that the gospel is good news. Not only of judicial forgiveness, but also of personal forgiveness, but relational forgiveness. Furthermore, how do you teach your brother the gospel? Run to him after worship. Blurt out, I'm a sinner too. I forgive you. Promise him you will not hold it over him. Tell her that you will not gossip about it and then speak not of it again. Remember their sins and iniquities no more. Teach them that gospel that remembers our sins and iniquities no more. Pursue relational forgiveness. Bring them to your house. Have a party for them. Kill the fatted calf. Show them as salt and light that the gospel works. That the gospel works. It does. It relates sinners to God and it can relate sinners to one another. It works. And then finally, how do you teach your unbelieving friend the gospel? Forgive them with a free spirit. Show that if God can reconcile two old buzzards who bicker about the property line or the pet defecating on the other's lawn or the unreturned borrowed ladder or whatever, if the gospel can bring about the reconciliation through human relationship forgiveness, then perhaps they might want to know how the same God can forgive them and reconcile not only the neighbor to you, but can reconcile them to God. Teach them the gospel through your forgiveness. My dear beloved, we must forgive as we have been forgiven for the sake of the gospel, not our own. Let's pray.